Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic we're going to look at what I am calling the bracketed secant method. However, it is also known as the false position method or the regula falsi. So in this topic, we will describe a modification to the bisection method, basically where the next estimation is not the midpoint, but rather the root of the interpolating linear polynomial. We will try to determine the rate of convergence of this algorithm with an empirical example. That is, we will look at an actual example and see what the rate of convergence is. We will then discuss some differences between this and the bisection method, and we will look at an, an implementation. All right, let's take a step beyond the bisection method. Suppose we have a real valued function of a real variable, and we have that a root is bounded by two points, a sub k and b sub k. That is, the value of the function has opposite signs at these endpoints, and the function is assumed to be continuous on that interval. Now, the bisection method chooses the midpoint. However, taking a look at this function, you may think, well, wait a second, why not find an interpolating line that connects the two endpoints, and then, as a better approximation of the root, choose the root of that interpolating line. All right, in this case, the value of the function at that point is positive, and what we would then do is we would update the right-hand endpoint, but not the left-hand endpoint. And we could continue iterating in this manner. Now, what is the root of the line connecting these two points? Well, first of all, before we can find the root, we have to find the line. Well, if we just have the value of the function at a sub k plus the slope times x minus a sub k, that will pass through those two points. And again, the slope is rise over run. If we now equate this to zero, we can then bring f at a sub k to the right-hand side. All right. Now, having done so, we can divide by the multiplier of the x minus a sub k by both sides, giving us this expression here, and then sub add a sub k to both sides. This is the root of that interpolating line. And again, it makes no sense if, the if f at a sub k and f at b sub k are equal. All right, we found that root. And you can play with that root a little bit more, and you can get the following formula. The problem with this formula is you don't really know how the product of f at b sub k and a sub k minus the product at f at a sub k times b sub k are going to interact. So there's a possibility that subtractive cancellation may occur. Consequently, uh, we'd rather avoid subtractive cancellation. So instead, we're going to use the formula we just found on the previous slide. So thus we will adopt the root being this expression. Now, take a look at that expression. Does that look familiar in any way? It should, because essentially we are having a sub k minus f at a sub k over an approximation of the slope. That sounds a lot like Newton's method. The only issue here is we don't actually know what the exact derivative of the function is. Instead, the slope is the slope of the 
interpolating linear polynomial. All right then. Given two bounds, a sub k and b sub k, such that f evaluated at these two endpoints have opposite signs, we will find the in root of the interpolating linear polynomial that passes through these two points. Now, if f evaluated this point is actually equal to zero, we have found a root, so we're done. We'll return r sub k. However, if f at a sub k and f at r sub k have opposite signs, then we will leave a sub k unchanged and we will update the right endpoint with r sub k. Otherwise, of course, we're going to update a sub k plus one to be the new to be the root that we just found. All right, how does convergence occur? Well, in this example below, where the function is concave up in the vicinity of the root, we find the interpolating linear polynomial and we find its root. We then evaluate the function at that point and determine we have to update the left-hand endpoint. We then find the interpolating linear polynomial between these two new points, find the root, and then again evaluate the function at that point. Thus, at least in this example, you'll see that one endpoint tends to become fixed. In this example, the right-hand endpoint. So consequently, the distance between b sub k and a sub k is not actually going to go to zero. In fact, it's going to be bound below by b sub k minus the actual root. Now, in theory, the root could actually be arbitrarily close to the other endpoint as opposed to at our estimation of where the root is. So the maximum root could be b sub k minus a sub k, but that's very unlikely. Um, instead, what we will do is we will continue iterating until this new root we find minus the left-hand endpoint is less than epsilon step or the right-hand right endpoint minus this new approximation of the root is less than the minimum step size. Now you may have noticed that we haven't actually done the error analysis. That's because it's actually rather complex. Let's first try to investigate what the rate of the reduction of the error is based on an example. We'll use the same example as before, where again, the solution is ln of two. So we're going to have various k values from zero to 10. We'll have the endpoints a sub k and b sub k, the function evaluate at these points, the root of the interpolating polyno linear polynomial, the value of the function at that point, the error, and once we've gotten to the second iteration, the error over the previous error. All right, so we start with a sub k, a sub naught is equal to zero and b sub naught is equal to one. We have the value of the function at these two points. We find the root. We see that it is negative and therefore we're going to update the right endpoint. All right, once at this point, we find the root of the interpolating polynomial. We see that the function evaluated at that point is negative. So once again, we will update the right endpoint. However, now notice that the error has gone down by a little bit. How much? By a factor of 0 0.6949. All right, we've updated the right hand endpoint. We find the interpolating linear polynomial between these two points. There it is. And the error has gone down again. By what amount? 0 
So it seems that the next error is approximately 0 0.6 and something times the previous error. Let's keep going. Here's the new root, 0 0.67. Update the right-hand endpoint, find the root. Again, the error goes down by 0 0.666. Calculate the new, there's two new endpoints having updated the right-hand endpoint. There's the root, 0 0.662, so on and so forth. And we see that as we continue iterating, the error appears to be dropping by a constant times the previous error. Now, this is still better than the bisection method, but it seems as if the error is simply dropping by a constant approximately 0 0.65 times the previous error. That seems to suggest that the bracketed secant method is also order H, just like the bisection method. All right, so we've more or less deduced that it appears that the error is dropping by big O of H. The issue here is that one of the endpoints is fixed. How do we resolve that? Well, one way to solve this problem is to alternate between using the bracketed secant method and the bisection method. Now, let's look at an implementation. Once again, we'll assert that the left-hand endpoint is indeed less than the right-hand endpoint. We'll calculate the function at each of these points. If either of them is not a real number, we will return not a number. If f at a is 0, we'll return a. If f at b is 0, we'll return b. Carrying on, we have our for loop. So we'll have a maximum number of iterations we will calculate the root of the interpolating linear polynomial, and we will calculate the value of the function at that point. Now, if that value of the function at that point is not finite, that is it's infinity or not a number, we will return not a number. We have not found the root. Now, if the value of the function at the root is zero, we have found a root and therefore we will return r. This is likely not going to happen. Alternatively, if the sine bit of a, f evaluated at a, and f evaluated at this root are the same, we will be updating the left-hand endpoint. But before we do that, we check. Is the root sufficiently close to a and is the value of the function at this root sufficiently small? If both these conditions are true, we will assume that r is a good approximation of the root and return r. Alternatively, we will update a. As for the complementary alternative block, same thing we check. We are going to update b. However, if b is already sufficiently close to the next approximation of the root and the value of the function is sufficiently small at that new root, we will return r. Otherwise, we will update both b and the value at b. After this, the larger loop ends and if we actually get to the end of this loop and have not returned, that indicates that we should return not a number, indicating a failure. Following this topic, you now have an understanding of the ideas that will be covered in this topic. In addition to determining how to simply evaluate a polynomial, you understand that we will be looking at 
functions that represent actual values in the real world. And we, these will be functions either of space or of time. These exact functions are represented by f of x or y of t. You are aware that we will only be able to sample these actual values periodically. So either in space with a difference of delta, uh, h or periodic throughout time with a difference of delta t. You understand also that these samples may either be exact, represented by f at x sub k or y at t sub k, or these may be readings that are assumed to come from sensors that are combined with random error. So f sub k is assumed to be a sample of the actual value f at x sub k, but combined with error so that it's no longer exact. And that error is usually assumed to be quite significant, up to 10% relative error. You are aware that we will then try to approximate the value of polynomials interpolating these points in both cases, the derivatives of these at these points, and the integrals over a sequence of these points. And the goal of all of this is to approximate as closely as, pro clo closely as possible the properties of the actual underlying functions f at x or y of t. Here are the references, acknowledgments, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!